Hi, I'm Tim McKay. Please join me in this video where I go over my proposed solution whereby we do not need remote ID in fixed wing RC airplanes. Let's get to it. Thank you for tuning in. I just want to apologize in advance. The audio for the first part of the video is not great. I am on my third set of microphones. I'm doing this portion directly into the iPhone microphone. Uh, if anybody has a good idea of a remote microphone, an iPhone 12, please let me know in the comment sections. But thank you for tuning in. Hi, as I mentioned, I'm Tim. This is being filmed in October of 2023. And what I'd like to do is give you my ideas about how the modeling community, community can get relief from needing remote ID for fixed wing RC models. We'll talk about the drones uh, in part of this discussion as well. There'll be a lot to cover. As always, thank you for the likes and subscribes. They truly help the channel. And if you want to jump ahead, there are chapters of the timeline. Just skip ahead to uh, those if you want to go to a particular section of the video. So the subject is remote ID. Most people should be familiar with the remote ID. Just a very quick history, how it applies to this video. The idea of remote ID that they can track where the drone is, but more importantly, track where the pilot location was for the takeoff of the drone was kicked around 2014, 2015. Remote ID became a reality with the 2018 FAA authorization bill. The authorization bill was a big deal because that was a five-year bill in 2018. You'll notice that it runs out this year in 2023. The FAA is working on the 2023 authorization bill, and that will be a huge part of the discussion later on in the video. But in any event, in 2018, it's important to understand that the FAA, like any government agency, is funded by Congress. I think their annual budget is around $16 billion a year. Congress decides what to do, gives orders to the FAA in terms of the authorization bill. The FAA just has to follow those orders. One of those orders very directly from Congress to the FAA in 2018 was to do something about remote ID. Just get to do something about remote ID. Things were happening in a hurry. Uh, the FAA was, um, had to produce results of remote ID. And I think looking back on all that, the FAA was fairly new to model aviation. Remember, up until 2018, there was not a single FAA regulation on model aviation. The closest the FAA came was a 1981 uh, advisory circular, which was essentially the AMA safety code. AMA modelers with radio control models, we tended to go to our airfields. We stuck around the airfields. There were minimal airspace violations. If an airfield was near a working airport, there was just about always a letter of agreement. We just didn't cause any disturbance or safety issues to the FAA uh, up until quite recently. What changed everything was the drones, and I'll get into more discussion why uh, the drones um, affected a lot of thinking with the FAA. So the FAA, without a lot of knowledge of modeling activities, because they just they hadn't written a single regulation on them, had to do something on remote ID, and the FAA went to the term UAS, Unmanned Aircraft System, and what had happened was they just lumped together drones with fixed wing model aircraft. When I say fixed wing, I'm including helicopters as well, but as well, but I just kind of differentiate drones and fixed wings. Now, a lot of people on YouTube videos and elsewhere go, why didn't the FAA separate the fixed wing and the drones? They're two different things. I agree. That'll be part of this video. I believe things were happening so fast with a, with a lack of a deep understanding or contacts within the modeling community, the FAA just made the decision to describe unmanned aircraft as drones and RC model aircraft uh, together. So the way the process works, the FAA is going to write a regulation on remote ID. What the FAA do, they'll have discussions, they'll do study, and they'll write a notice of proposed rulemaking. It's just a draft of the regulation. We think this is what we want to do in remote ID. So the FAA released that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking several years ago for remote ID, it was a complete disaster. It would literally have killed or severely wounded the RC hobby industry. Uh, for example, FRIAs, the FAA recognized identification area, were allowed for one year only. It's going to be a transition, then everybody had to have some form of remote ID. 
there was going to be a national database you had to log on to before you could take off to track all your flights. There would have been a fee for that national database. It just would have been awful. Now, luckily, as part of the federal rulemaking progress, even though it's a regulation, it's called a, a rule for, for um, implementation purposes, the FAA had to put that out for comments. And the FAA got over 53,000 comments of the remote ID ruling. And they, they read every comment. And if you go through the 470-page um, final rule on remote ID, the FAA goes through all those comments of what they decided to do. An important point about the FAA receiving the comments, the FAA has been tasked by Congress to write a remote ID ruling. So they're going to write a remote ID ruling. And so what you want to do is figure out a thoughtful, professional, productive way to engage with the FAA and Congress, who's writing directions to the FAA, to try to shape that outcome to your advantage. You cannot go to the FAA, pound on the table, take a stand, say you've got to do this, it's going to be the end of the hobby, my grandkids can't learn to fly, there's going to be no more pilots from the U.S. airline industry, and a bunch of emotional outbursts. The FAA will just disregard that because at the end of the day, they have to produce a ruling and they want something to work with so that you can help them with what you'd like to see for the outcome of that. I've got a lot more of that later on in the video. So as a result of those 53,000 comments, remember other people are talking to the FAA uh, that support model aviation, the Aircraft and Owners Pilots Association, the Experimental Aircraft Association, and also the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Uh, the Academy of Model Aeronautics would spend weeks at a time in Washington at FAA meetings and government meetings advocating what would be a good approach for remote ID. Remember, in these discussions, everybody has their equities. Nobody's going to get everything you want. You try to get the best outcome, and you can always engage later on in time. So what had happened for the original rule, we got some wins. Uh, for example, FRIAs, the FAA recognized identification area, instead of being one year, they're going away. They're good now for four years. And there are hundreds of FRIAs approved on the AMA website. So that's a good thing. The other thing is the FAA didn't quite understand production of um, RC model airplanes, how we build them at home. The FAA likes working with an aircraft producer. Well, the producer is me with my foam board models. So they agreed to have standard remote ID built into the factory for all drones after December 22nd, 2022. And for um, non-drone aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, we can have a broadcast module if we're flying outside of a FRIA. So that, and also there was no national database to log on. It's simply a broadcast model. You only can track the model when it's flying with a broadcast remote ID. So the FAA, all these were written several years back. They estimated everything would be in order by September 16th, 2023 for the remote ID. On September 13th of 2023, there were literally no remote ID broadcast modules available. So the FAA has slipped the compliance date uh, six months to March 16th, 2024. So to be clear, remote ID is in effect as of September 16th, 2023. It's just that there will be no enforcement of the remote ID rules until March 16th, 2023, uh, because of the lack of uh, broadcast remote ID modules. And so as I mentioned, we're gonna circle back to Congress and the FAA as aviators, and we are aviators as RC model airplane pilots, we now for the first time have an FAA regulation with remote ID, and we just have got to start dealing in our cross-check with the FAA and Congress to have discussions with them to shape understanding thoughts, decisions in our favor. But it's important to see what Congress thought about remote ID in 2018. So remember the FAA works with the Department of Transportation, DOT, is a cabinet level officer, office. And this is what DOT said in their report to Congress um, outlining just to make sure Congress uh, agreed and, and was in lockstep with what the FAA is doing. The DOT to Congress says, remote, quote, remote identification is fundamental to both safety and security of US operations. Remote identification will be necessary for routine beyond line of sight operations, operations over people, package deliveries, Operations over congested areas continue safe operation of all aircraft in shared airspace. Now notice, and I'll get back to this, that is pretty much what drones do. It's not the fixed wing RC. We don't really need to fly beyond visual line of sight over people, deliver packages over congested areas and so forth. 
And it, so what DOT continues to Congress with remote identification, the FAA and our national security public safety partners will be better able to identify a UAS and its operator, assess that the UAS is being operated in a clueless, careless, or criminal manner, take appropriate action if necessary. Remote identification is the FAA's highest priority UAS rulemaking effort. All right. So remember, let's go back to the FAA. What is the FAA's um, model, their, their, what, what their statement is? It's one sentence. It is to provide the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world. Safest and efficient. We're going to focus on safe because we don't really care about efficiency. We're not running airliners. And so what's happening with the remote ID when they talk about um, public safety partners, they're talking about drones, fixed-wing aircraft being operated in a clueless, careless, criminal manner, take appropriate action. The FAA is very concerned about safety uh, with um, unmanned aircraft, drones at our aircraft, at our fixed-wing aircraft, um, RC models. So my thought is, if you can convince the FAA that we're on their side, where we operate in a safe manner, we can demonstrate that we're offered in a safe manner, we will get some maneuvering room to get relief from the remote ID requirements. Now that the enforcement of a remote ID has been slipped to March 16, 2024, we do have some time to let the dust settle and kind of collect our, our thoughts to see what next steps are going to be. And this is an important time to do it because right now, Congress is writing the bill for the 2023 FAA authorization. I don't know how many years it's going to be, but there are a lot of things going into that bill that um, we would like to be part of that discussion process and see if we can get improvements for our RC model airplanes. So the first thing that comes to mind or to discussion is why did the FAA lump drones and fixed-wing RC aircraft together. They seem like they're two different communities with different flying habits and patterns. Why were they together? I don't know. I'm not a member of the FAA. I've been dealing with the FAA for 52 years. Also, I was uh, in Washington for seven years uh, at the Pentagon, so I have some idea of these interagency meetings. My guess is things were happening fast. As I mentioned before, there was not a lot of knowledge. The FAA lumped them together. That was just the easiest way to move forward and meet the congressional um, direction to cover unmanned aircraft systems. So the FAA just put together drones and fixed wings. That's where we are for now. But I maintain, and I think others will agree, that really there's two different types of flying between fixed wings and drones. With fixed wings RC, we tend to go to modeling fields. We need runways to take off. We need instructors and so forth to learn how to fly. A day at the field, we just like to watch the airplanes fly. We practice touch and go landings. We do some aerobatics. We just watch our models fly and, and just that's what we do. Also, we can demonstrate to the FAA that we are safe. Again, the FAA is focused on safety. We have followed the AMA safety code for literally over 75 years. We have just had a safe operation and there have been basically no sightings reports of fixed wing aircraft at all. Drones on the other hand are different. Um, drones are a remarkable technological achievement. They are just something that couldn't even been envisioned perhaps 20 years ago. A person can go to Best Buy, get a drone, uh, they can open it up in the parking lot, uh, take off from the parking lot, you don't need any instruction, you can fly distances, and the important thing about drones is every drone has one thing in common. They have a camera. And so drone operators are incentivized not to practice touch and goes or traffic patterns or aerobatics that much. They like to take pictures. And so they're incentivized to explore beyond a local flying site, to take their pictures, and to do uh, some operations over people, some beyond line, line of sight operations and so forth. And don't get me wrong, the pictures that drone operators take are gorgeous. I love watching YouTube videos of the drone pictures being taken. They're absolutely breathtaking. But it's a different type of flying than fixed wing that tends to have you fly outside of the local area searching new areas to take your pictures and just explore the world. Also keep in mind that with a following the AMA safety code by and large the past 75 years, with the Academy of Model Aeronautics, it is the world's largest model airplane organization. There's over 200,000 members for the organization. And that is important when you're dealing with the FAA and Congress that you speak from a community-based organization. 
could be Aircraft and Owners Pilots Association, the Experimental Aircraft Association, rather than individual, the fact that you have an organization that tries to um, give guidance to what your activities are is meaningful to the people in Washington, D.C. So I must talk a little bit about the FAA's UAS Sightings Report. You can easily find it. Just Google FAA UAS Sightings Report, and this is what it looks like. I'll show it on the screen here in a moment. These are reports by pilots of unmanned aircraft that they saw, and it's done by quarters for every three months. And you'll find that there's roughly, over each quarter, about four to five sightings per day of a drone in controlled airspace without a clearance. Now, I've had some comments saying, well, geez, there hasn't been a fatality between a drone and an aircraft, so what's the big issue? It's a big issue. When you fly into Class B controlled airspace without a clearance, if you're in your CES as a general aviation pilot, you will in all likelihood get your license suspended for a period of time. It is, it is called ATC or air traffic control for a reason. They want to control aircraft to prevent um, accidents. And so just looking through this, I've highlighted some. It was uh, from uh, Santa Ana, California. It was a 737 reported a quadcopter um, at 100 feet above the aircraft on seven mile final. Another one from San Francisco, a CRJ-9 uh, from Canada, uh, reported a gray quadcopter with package attached at the 3 o'clock position at 500 feet. Another one from Orlando, there was a Piper, reported a small gray quad-type UAS in about 1,000 feet. Atlantic City, this is a Navy P-8 submarine patrol aircraft, 737 variant, reported a quadcopter UAS with a 9 o'clock position. These are quadcopters, okay? There's no fixed-wing aircraft in these because the quadcopters are not paying attention to the airspace. I guess they're taking pictures. This is not helpful to the FAA where we're trying to advocate that we are a safe operation and uh, advocating safety for everybody involved with our flights. We've described the problem uh, that we have with fixed wing and drones dealing with the FAA and um, Congress. Now, let's, in the immortal words of Colonel Jessup, let's hear what he has to say. I want to know what we're going to do about this. That's right. So what are we going to do about this problem? So in terms of what we're going to do, there is a way ahead. I'm going to propose it in this portion of the video where we can present a case with the objective of getting relief from re all remote ID requirements for fixed wing RC aircraft. So what we need is a strategy, something that will guide our actions to get to this goal. And I would offer that there are three things we can use for this strategy. Uh, the first one is that fixed wing uh, RC pilots, we follow the rules. If you're talking about safety of the FAA, you have to follow the rules. And what I mean by follow the rules is there are no controlled airspace violations from fixed wing flyers. We fly in uncontrolled airspace. We stay in uncontrolled airspace. You don't have to worry about us. Not the case of the drone people, but that's the story we would tell for fixed wing. Also, our general flight patterns and habits of fixed wings are not a threat to control airspace. We respect airspace, we respect people, and we respect safety as part of our daily flying processes at club uh, airfields or even in our backyard out in the middle of nowhere. We, we stay within visual line of sight. We don't stray away. We're out of controlled airspace. And there's a couple other conditions I'll mention at the end of this video that will reinforce that, that the fixed wing aircraft are not going to be a threat to controlled airspace. We'll stay where we are. Therefore, FAA and Congress, you can remove the requirement for remote ID for fixed wing aircraft. So how do we do this? Um, what has to happen is because we're dealing with a highly regulated um, organization, the FAA, focused on safety, reported to Congress, you have to engage with folks in Washington. And what is important when you deal with these people is that you're speaking their language. With the FAA, as we mentioned, their motto is airspace safety and efficiency. If we can tie everything that we do back to safety, that message will resonate and be received better by the folks in Washington, D.C. Now, I know there are some RC models out there that says, well, gee whiz, I've been flying for years without Washington. Well, why do we need this regulation? It's government overreach. I, I hear what you're saying. The problem is times change. 
the airspace is getting more crowded. There's a lot of commercial air activity. We would probably not be in this predicament if there were not controlled airspace violations on a fairly routine basis by some RC pilots, primarily the drone people. We're lumped together for not good reasons. What we're trying to do is differentiate and explain to the FAA that there's different types of fixed wing flying and the fixed wing modelers are not something you need to worry about with all the very important work you're doing for unmanned aircraft operations in a very busy uh, airspace. So going to the FAA and shouting at them, holding your ground, saying my grandkids can't learn how to fly because of you bad people, uh, the airline industry is going to crash because young people won't be flying drones, uh, threatening, uh, strong language. It doesn't do any good. The FAA gets that type of language on a daily basis from Boeing, traveling public, air traffic controllers. There's dozens of groups that are dealing with the FAA. At the end of the day, the FAA can make a decision on what they want to do with the final rule. They will get inputs, they'll evaluate them, but if you think that just uh, shouting and threatening them is going to get, you're going to prevail in that discussion, it's just not going to work. And I respect the fact that many people viewing this have not had experience in Washington with these meetings. It's just the way that things work in Washington for these very important issues where you have a lot of very powerful competing groups searching for the same thing, which is their um, rules and the way of operating in the national airspace system through the FAA. So what I like to do in something like this, where again, the modeling community is kind of new dealing with the FAA and um, Congress, they've been, these organizations may not be fully familiar with um, model aviation and what we do, what we don't do. I try to look at another organization that has had success in these matters that deals with um, aviation on a daily basis and see if we can learn anything from them. And a perfect example of this is ALPA, the Airline Pilots Association. Now, ALPA is one of the world's largest pilot unions. It's got about 75,000 members. It represents 43 airlines. And because airline pilots are just on an daily basis, completely synchronized, tied into the FAA. They are absolutely focused on dealing properly with Washington to get what they want for their members. Very often this union will be against the airlines, they'll be against um, the military perhaps for things that they want to do, but they're looking out for themselves. And a perfect example is this picture of about 90 pilots on the steps of the U.S. Capitol Pilots in full uniform, they're going to branch out, they've got appointments set up, they're going to be talking to representatives in an effort to move towards their direction and circle back to the FAA with what they have to say. And what's going to happen in all of these talks, they have talking points and what the message is going to be to Congress and the FAA is airline pilot support safety. Everything that they want to be done will be tied back to the safety. And so... What happens is this is a sheet. I'll put it up on the um, monitor here on the film in a second. The big focus right now is the 2023 FAA Reauthorization Act. There's going to be a lot of language in there that will affect a lot of things. ALPA is trying to determine this for their own members' benefits, but again, always tying it back to safety. So Congress has passed to poise legislation that threatens to weaken aviation safety. Um, as the world's largest non-governmental aviation safety organization, ALPA is committed to keeping flying safe. Add your voice to the safety of the skies. Right now, Congress is considering legislation that will determine the direction of U.S. aviation for the next five years. Current path threatens safety. House bill has considerations that could degrade safety. And it's everything from pilot um, retirement age 65 to 67, cockpit doors, crew rest requirements, everything. They're all tying it back to safety. As a matter of fact, it is organized enough that on their website, they have these little sections here where you just click on a button, you can write, call, or support, tell your representative to support primary security doors, cargo plans for safety, oppose an increase in retirement for commercial pilots, safety, tell Congress to support mandatory secondary matters, tell Congress safety matters, preserve current first officer qualification set, uh, standards. So by tying everything back to safety, they are trying to give this very busy organization, the FAA, a solution instead of a problem while still meeting their member needs. 
Now, as I mentioned, the, the only game in town we have is the uh, Academy of Model Aeronautics. There's a lot of people that don't like the AMA. That's fine. You, you're, you're free to have whatever you want opinion of them. But right now, they're the only game in town that is an organized group of people that represents, in the case of the AMA, the world's largest modeling community, 200,000 members. That resonates with the FAA. It's not just a person up there advocating for what that person wants. It's the AMA. So this is just an example of a report from the AMA uh, Government Affairs blog in, back in April of 2023. The AMA Government Affairs team recently spent a week in Washington, D.C. having congressional meetings to discuss the 2023 FAA reauthorization bill. And this is an interesting development. While on Capitol Hill, the team had the opportunity to sit down with Congressman Randy Yakum, the vice chairman of the House Aviation Subcommittee. Congressman is an avid supporter of model aviation, has been vocal about his belief that laws regarding model aircraft operations need to be recalibrated. So what you do is you build a relationship with this person, and now he understands what's going on. He can advocate you for you in the meetings that you're not going to be attending all the time to get desired outcome. And if he can reinforce what you want to do with the message that you don't have to worry about us, we promote safety, and we will follow the rules, it will be helpful. So what, what would be some things that we could discuss with Congress and the FAA to try to get fixed wing radio control models relieved of the requirement of any remote ID equipment, not just in FRIAs, but anywhere. So what I would say is the discussion right now is for fixed wing aircraft only. We're not talking about drones. Drones and fixed wings were lumped together, as I said several times in this video. I think that was a mistake, but if you try to defend safety with what the drones are doing to controlled airspace, you're not going to get anywhere. So we can just break out fixed wing. And once we get success of the fixed wing, then we can circle back for the drones at a later time. So just talking fixed wing RC. And the other thing I would say in the discussion is we would state that, and this is just discussion points, but we would state to Congress and the FAA that there will simply be no cameras allowed on any fixed wing RC airplane to get relief from the remote ID. If you don't have a camera, the camera is a motivating factor why you go out and about because you want to take pictures. If there's no camera on board, we can reinforce that we stay at our airfields just to touch and goes. For those fixed wing aircraft that want to put on a camera, that's fine. You're just going to have to have a remote ID module on your airplane. Also, I would say that uh, reinforcing this um, uh, discussion of safety is that these fixed wing aircraft are not capable of beyond line of sight. They can't fly to GPS waypoints. In other words, we always have to keep them in sight. That way, it's kind of a poor man see and avoid concept. We see the airplane, if for whatever reason we would see another full scale of manned aircraft in uncontrolled airspace, we could avoid that aircraft. Also, we need to reinforce uh, with Congress and the FAA, uh, aircraft, fixed wing aircraft these days, generally fly less than 15 minutes flight time. So we're keeping visual line of sight, 15 minutes, we can't go too far. In other words, we're gonna stay at our home airfield. And finally, say that we've been doing this for the past two to three years since the remote ID ruling came in. For 75 years before on the AMA safety code, we are a safe organization we stay in uncontrolled airspace. You don't have to worry about airspace violations with fixed wing pilots. And if we could put all that together with a story a couple of years from now to demonstrate that the remote ID is to locate the um, location of the pilot, but with FRIAs, we have an opportunity to demonstrate that, look, you let us use the FRIA, the FAA recognized identification area, we do not need any hardware in the FRIA, and we respect the FRIA boundaries. So just we can be trusted to follow essentially the FRIA concept, even if you're not at a club airfield because of the visual line of sight with the models, and we don't need remote ID, again, with the other conditions of no camera, no beyond visual uh, line of sight, and we, we fly for less than 15 minutes. And again, the FAA, they're an incredibly busy organization. There's a million things going on. What we want to do with these people is offer them a solution and not a problem to the, whatever issue they're dealing with.
And then just the final note is uh, we are separating ourselves from the drone uh, pilots. Um, I understand that can be a difficult thing to discuss. However, uh, to make progress, I think it's going to be necessary to segregate the two types of flying, fixed wing and drones. And I would say to all the fellow drone pilots, you've got to stop violating controlled airspace before you're going to be having uh, productive discussions with the FAA and Congress on any relief from remote ID. So those are my thoughts for now. Um, subject for a lot of discussion. Thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you on the next video. Thank you.